Here we go. Um, should we get started? Yeah, okay. Well, hello. Um, my name is Jordan Dugan. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here with Laura Ross. They use they, them pronouns. And then I'm here with um, Brittany Hardin. And they use, or she uses she, her pronouns. Um, and we're gonna be talking about trauma recovery and resilience today. And this is the last part of our trauma-informed series. So happy to have you all here. Um, and it's been a pleasure to do these parts with you. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna have a QR code for our pretest. Um, I'm gonna drop the link in the chat. Um, we ask that everyone does the um, the pretest. It just gives us a good sense if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, and yeah, so we'll give you like five minutes to do it. It shouldn't take very long. Give you all one minute. Yeah. When everyone's ready, go ahead and drop a thumbs up in the chat. Um, and that'll let us know that you guys are ready to move on. Okay, I got one. Fifty two. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to get ready to move on to our next slide. Um, this is the final part of our four-part uh, educational series. Um, it is meant to present trauma-informed approaches within the LGBT community. Um, and a lot of the information that we're going to talk about builds upon the previous uh, trainings. So please check out our YouTube if you want more information about trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and the majority of the series has been specifically focused on childhood trauma, substance use, trauma resilience, and recovery. Um, like I said, all through the lens of trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy. There is the link to the YouTube channel right there for you guys to screenshot. And we will also send it in the follow-up email after this presentation. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, for this particular objective, we are going to give a brief overview about the LGBTQ Center here in OC and the Elevate program, which we, Jordan and I work under. Um, we're gonna go over trauma and define the types of trauma, uh, specifically highlight the, the effects of complex trauma, um, the types of trauma that specifically uh, LGBTQ folks experience and the somatic or bodily effect of trauma that is specific to LGBTQ folks. And then we're gonna spend time uh, talking about coping and recovering from said trauma. 
first just a little bit about um, the LGBTQ centers um, programs we have here and the Elevate program. Um, Laura, if you could maybe, there it is. Um, so just a little bit about the LGBTQ center here. Um, so the LGBTQ center's mission is to advocate on behalf of Orange County's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning folks of the community. And we do that through services that we provide and we just wanna ensure well-being and positive identities for folks of our community. Um, we do that through our youth programs, such as the Elevate Youth Program, um, through our community programs, events, um, through our mental health and emotional wellness services, our trans health and wellness services, our HIV prevention and awareness services, our immigration services, our advocacy and education, which is similar to what we're doing today, and our voluntary, volunteering opportunities that we have to the public. Um, a little bit about the Elevate Youth California program um, is that our goal here is to reframe substance use as a public health issue by combating the detrimental effects from the war on drugs on the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus youth and young adults. Um, and we wanna do so through providing trauma-informed counseling and process groups at no cost. Um, at the end of this presentation, we will be going through um, a lot of our groups that we have here at the LGBTQ Center, but specifically within the Elevate program. Um, we will show you that calendar at the end. And we also um, do individual counseling for youth and young adults at no cost. Um, and we also raise awareness um, through social media campaigns, um, activities and events such as this. Um, so yeah, that's our Elevate program. So first tonight, we're gonna be looking at what is trauma? Um, and we've touched about touched on it in our other parts of our series, but just as a refresher, um, trauma is a highly complex, individualized and personalized phenomenon that has been defined as an event or series of events or situations that are shocking, terrifying, overwhelming, and that produce these intense and overpowering feelings of fear and helplessness. Um, and as we've talked about before, is that everyone experiences trauma differently and what might make traumatic or what might be traumatic um, and have prolonged offense for one person might be normal experiences in other families or individuals. Um, but there is no right way or wrong way to process this trauma. Um, unfortunately, it does not know any bounds regardless of um, socioeconomic status, race, um, or location, um, trauma happens across the board. But what we do see is that it does happen at higher rates within the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus community. Um, and that's why we're talking about it here today. And then on the next slide. Um, this is a review, a quick review of what we talked about last time when we were talking about trauma. Um, the ACES score or the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, um, which was done by Casa Permanente in 1995 through about 1997. Adverse childhood experiences are potentially stressful or traumatic events that have occurred between the ages of zero to 17. Um, the ACES study was conducted, like I said, in 1995 um, and included more than 17,000 people um, receiving physical exams and interviews. Um, ACEs have been found to have both emotional and physical effects on the body. And these effects uh, contribute to serious health diagnoses, such as CART disease and diabetes and other uh, various uh, diagnoses. Um, when, they, uh, when they interviewed about the ACEs study, they, their research included the following, um, child abuse, um, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, childhood neglect, um, emotional and physical, um, the mental health of a parent or person in the home, um, having a mental illness, uh, being depressed or suicidal, 
um, addiction, um, being addicted to substances or alcohol in of a family member, especially if it's a parent uh, or caregiver, witnessing uh, domestic violence against a caregiver, um, a loss of parent to death, abandonment or divorce, and incarceration, incarceration of a close family member um, is also included in the study. Um, the CDC later expanded uh, to include uh, systemic issues, um, such as the impacts of historical ongoing traumas due to systematic racism and the impacts of multiple generational poverty, um, which results in limited education and social and economic uh, opportunities. These include, like I said, systemic trauma, racism, systemic oppression, microaggressions, stereotypical threats, um, violence, um, and that is exposure to community of violence. Um, LGBT and BIPOC communities especially are at risk for violence. Um, like I talked about, multi-generational uh, poverty and the lack of resources uh, and discipline. And this, this is specifically talking about uh, overly punitive school discipline and the prison, uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, LGBTQ folks are twice as likely to experience these ACEs, and that is compounded um, if you belong to another uh, marginalized group. Yes, and um, a couple types of trauma we see are, um, we're gonna classify in a couple different groups. So there is acute trauma, which results from an individual being exposed to a single or overwhelming traumatic event, such as the death of a family member or the death of a parent um, during one's childhood. Um, symptoms of an acute trauma could include detailed memories relating to the traumatic event, um, exaggerated startle responses or hypervigilance, um, emotional overreactions, and maybe some misconceptions as it comes to this trauma. Um, another type of trauma is, is complex trauma. And this results from um, protracted exposure to traumatic experiences, such as um, emotional abuse by one's parents during childhood. Um, this can also look in terms of symptoms as disassociation, as psychological numbing, um, the person might struggle with rage or anger, um, or the person might socially withdraw and might have a sense of a foreshortened future um, and might have symptoms of SI. Um, another example of that would be um, something that we classify as insidious trauma. And that also encompasses the cultural um, narrative as it come as it applies to LGBTQ plus folks um, in the cultural narrative of homophobic or transphobic um, like um, bigotries and um, news and society um, and how that influences the individual. Um, what we see is that it creates the systemic marginalization and oppression of LGBTQ individuals by othering their experiences and making their experience a whole trauma within an, in itself um, and also isolating the individual. And this ongoing cycle is re-traumatizing to the individual and it's all due to the homo homophobic and transphobic societal views. Um, another uh, part of trauma, type three, is crossover trauma. Um, like acute tra trauma, uh, crossover trauma also results from a single overwhelming event. However, the case in the case of crossover trauma, the traumatic event is so devastating um, that the adverse psychological effects of the trauma are long term. An um, example of this type of trauma is like being involved in like a car crash and say one of uh, family members are killed. Um, the chief symptoms of crossover trauma include an extended mourning or complex mourning, um, depression, chronic pain, uh, sleep disorders, uh, 
like insomnia and nightmares, difficulty concentrating and irritability. And in children and news, this can look like symptoms of ADHD or uh, uh, bipolar or even um, uh, disorder, defiant disorders. And the effects of this trauma on the body, um, especially when it comes to children exposures early on in childhood, um, can often be invasive or interpersonal and have long-term effects in their neurodevelopment. These events are so severe and per pervasive that, um, that the individual will carry those on and that affects how they think about themselves and how they feel and in turn how they behave and what informs those um, actions and reactions. Um, as we talked about in other parts in the earlier parts of the series um, is how CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is seen to aid in this um, processing of this complex trauma into unpacking um, the individual's thoughts about the trauma, thoughts about themselves within the trauma, and the feelings that they have during it, um, the feelings they think about themselves, and, and how that informs their behaviors. And that's why, um, as it pertains to complex trauma, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most effective therapy to be seen for this kind of trauma. Although it's not gonna work for every case, um, it seemed to be the most um, research-backed, effectively um, relevant treatment for this kind of trauma. Um, now we're gonna highlight um, specific traumas to the LGBTQ uh, uh, community. Um, as we've talked about in all of the series, homophobia and transphobia can create hostile environments for LGBTQ folks in all public social settings and institutions. Um, transgender and non-binary folks experience high levels of peer and adult violence. We highlighted that specifically in our substance use um, us talk. Um, and adult physical violence to correct or censor gender non-conforming behaviors. Um, intersectional identities uh, such as race, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, being from a, a sexual minority, creates additional forms of oppression and discrimination. And these all compound upon each other, stack upon each other. Um, and that is affected if you have higher ACE scores. Um, if you haven't taken the ACE score study, I highly recommend that you look it up. Um, it is, uh, it's interesting to see how our childhoods have affected how we interact with our worlds today. Um, also being disproportionately impacted by homelessness um, and the trauma that comes from being unhoused and rejection of family origin. Often um, when there comes to a rejection, uh, we're talking about specifically about rejection, uh, that happens when a person comes out to their family and then they are housed, they are unhoused uh, by that family. Um, and uh, that leads to uh, substance use often um, in order to like un maladaptively cope with these, uh, with these stressors. Um, another, uh, some other uh, traumas that we wanna highlight are hate crimes, um, incidents and related to that, uh, verbal, physical and sexual assaults, intimate parlor violence, uh, discrimination in housing, social care and healthcare. Um, once again, rejection from not only their home life and family, but friends and coworkers um, when coming out. Um, due to prejudice, many people delay or coming out or never come out. Um, that causes stress in the body um, as well as emotional distress. Lesbian, bisexual women also report high levels of sexual abuse by others trying to fix their sexual orientation, which is referred to corruptive rape or curative rape. 
um, also reparative therapy or conversion therapy as it's more popularly known, which is induces another form of religious trauma on top of that. And then conclude uh, shock therapy, isolation from others, withholding affection and, um, and this all compounds upon each other. Yeah, and those traumas do compound upon each other and, and how that affects someone's body um, and the, the toll that takes, that heavy toll that I'm sure a lot of us are feeling as we're hearing these traumas that people in the LGBTQ community face. Um, and these trauma responses can, or this trauma can lead to trauma responses that are physiological, psychological, and emotional, and spiritual in nature. And as for the physiological effects, this could be seen in maybe being hyper aroused to situations, to sounds, um, to certain sounds, loud noises. Um, this could be seen in dilated pu pupils, muscle contractions, increased heart rate, um, increased blood pressure um, are just a couple examples. And when it comes to the psychological effects of trauma on the body, um, what we've seen is when someone experiences um, a trauma response, um, they can fall into these four categories, which are fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. Um, and these triggers, any one of these triggers, um, this release of cortisol um, and other hormones such as dopamine, epiphedrine, and norepinephrine, and that can cause the person to, as I said, freeze up, maybe run, remove themselves from the situation, fawn, um, which would just be like trying to be compliant within that situation. Um, or want to fight back. Um, and an another example of like a maladaptive coping response to trauma is disassociation. Um, and that's seen as the maybe freezing and maybe a mixture of fawning in that moment. And it manifests an emotional and mental detachment from the significant traumatic event. Um, and these reactions to the stress are necessary and vital to the survival of human beings in these dangerous situations. However, though, these prolonged states of hyperarousal, of having our nerves up here all the time, can lead to problematic physiological manifestations um, of trauma, such as chronic pain, um, and lead to people and folks just trying to cope with that. Um, manifestation of the pain, as we talked about in the previous series, um, maybe turning to substances to help cope in that. And if this happens early on in childhood, it can impact neurodevelopment as the child grows up and gets older. Um, and repeated exposure to dramatic events can lead to persistent and lifelong maladaptive coping mechanisms um, with specific impairments due to the control of one's cognitive processing and reasoning skills and problem solving. And just like I mentioned earlier in, in these past series, um, that's why cognitive behavioral therapy is seen as such a effective modality when it comes to trauma. Next slide. Next, we have this helpful um, idea of, uh, of what we were talking about, this state of hyperarousal and um, fight or flight responses. Um, it's called the window of tolerance. This concept was originally developed by Dr. Don's, Dan Siegel. Um, he has a lot of cool parenting books that are very popular, um, early childhood books that are very popular right now. And he describes this optimal zone of arousal for a person to like function in da da uh, da daily life. Um, when a person is operating within this window, which is this yellow space on the, um, on the graph, um, they're able to effectively manage and cope with their emotions. Um, however, this space is impacted if we are, or if we are comfortable and if we're feeling safe. 
we are less likely to be able to function when we are filled with feelings of anxiety, exhaustion, or feeling out of control. That makes our window smaller. If you're experiencing trauma, you may not be able to tolerate additional stressful situations or self-regulate your emotions. And that leads to youth and young adults to find additional means of coping as we've spoke about throughout the series, substances uh, are a great way to disassociate. Um, and as we mentioned in the last slide and throughout the series, uh, TFCBT helps folk find a better way of coping. And I'm just gonna go through uh, the window of tolerance with you guys really quickly. Um, so here we have it. This red area uh, talks about copper arousal. It's like a volcano popping off. Um, that's when we're feeling anxious, angry, out of control, overwhelmed. Your body wants to fight or flight or run away. Um, it's not something you can choose. These are all reactions that take over. Um, and then we have the window of tolerance. That's when you're uh, able to feel like you can deal with what's ever happening. It's not saying that you're not stressed or that you're not uh, dealing with something stressful, it means that you're able to maintain a type of homeostasis. This is like the ideal place to be. When stress and trauma shrink your window of tolerance, it won't take you much to either go into hyperarousal, which is that like can't breathe uh, state or I got a fight state or hypoarousal, which we'll talk about later. Um, working with a practitioner, like we said with TFCBT, building a trauma narrative, can expand that window of tolerance so you don't like go straight to hyperarousal, hypoarousal. Um, once again, hypoarousal is feeling like a spacey, zoned out, numb, frozen in your body, like just want to shut down. And it's, once again, these are not things that you can actually choose. This is your body trying to get you out of a situation so you can survive. And it takes a long time to learn uh, that you don't need to be in these hyper or hypoarousive states, um, growing that window of tolerance is, is necessary to uh, resilience and uh, recovery. And as we've spoke about before um, with the ACEs study, are that um, sexual minority folks are seen to have higher rates of um, of adverse childhood experiences such as sexual assaults physical assaults, emotional maltreatment um, as compared to their heterosexual peers. Um, it's really important to understand the impact of trauma within the historical context of an individual of an individual's life, especially when it comes to LGBTQ plus folks um, as traumatic experiences from early on in life impact the reactions and behaviors um, and influence the way that the individual manages newer recent traumatic um, experiences. Um, as we've talked about earlier about the, um, the CBT, the cognitive behavioral model with um, how thoughts are linked to feelings and that informs um, how we behave and how we react to situations. Um, as it pertains to a LGBTQ plus person's life, for example, if they experienced rejection on early on in life, that might be a sensitive area. Um, if that um, also happened again. So having a good history um, of the individual to inform how treatment's gonna look, to make sure that we don't um, re-traumatize the individual and bring those experiences back. Um, the physiological or the psychological response and perception of traumatic experiences impact the physiological responses. And as I mentioned, um, CBT helps with this. Um, and both these defense mechanisms contribute to how this trauma manifests um, and how a person makes meaning and processes the personalized traumatic experience and is very important to determine the long-term traumatic responses. And as Brittany mentioned before, by widening that window of tolerance. Um, 
Um, there's a severe underreporting of LGBTQ uh, discrimination um, and incidences due to shame and stigma of reporting, um, and also due to the perceived hostility of law enforcement. Um, it's hard to know whether or not the police, investigators, and other advocates of, that are in uh, these institutional systems will care or even be supportive or su affirming. Um, for some, this can also increase their risk of trauma by revealing their sexual orientation or gender identity to an authoritative person who also might be hostile. Um, yeah. yeah, and as we're looking at multi-level trauma um, and how we've talked about there's so many layers to trauma um, and the types of trauma experiences experienced by an individual. Um, here are just a couple different levels of trauma that are seen within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, the first one is direct trauma, and that's experienced by an individual um, that might have, have faced a trauma based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, this could be maybe a microaggression or um, a stack of T's of misgendering. Um, this is seen as a direct trauma. Um, an indirect trauma um, would be hearing about or witnessing a person's traumatic experience. Some examples could include um, hearing someone's experience of coming out to their family and then hearing that they were rejected by their family. That can inform the individual that oh, if I come out to my family, I will be rejected too. Um, another type of trauma experienced is insidious trauma. And insidious trauma, I've touched on a little bit before, but that encompasses this cultural narrative experienced by the LGBTQ plus population in the homophobic or, and transphobic society as it relates to the heteroist and cisgenderist influences of society. Um, and again, it's seen in the othering experience of you are not in the acceptable group. Um, and especially right now, what we're seeing in our media, in our culture, in the news, um, is this insidious trauma being imposed on the LGBTQ plus community and in how they're othering, um, transgender folks and it's really sad to see and it does really cause trauma on a grand scale as it does on this community. Um, and then we're gonna focus how this, we focused on how trauma affects like the body and our emotions, but it, it, it directly impacts one's like identity development. And this kind of relates to like when we were talking about our core beliefs, one sense of self, or self-concept, self-worth, self-esteem is an important aspect of identity development. Um, and sexual trauma has traditionally been thought to cause an individual, an individual's sexual orientation or gendered identity. Um, sexual trauma or physical trauma can cause fear of developed identities due to the association between the violent experience and the self-identity and can prevent people from fully developing their identity. It's not physically safe. It's not sexually safe for me to explore myself or how I want to be seen by others. Um, I know that on a core level because of all the experience with sexual assaults or physical trauma. This sense of self is impacted by insidious trauma, which we talked about in the last slide, due to the overarching message that their sexual orientation or gender identity is wrong. Like we talked about in the first part of our series, we swallow these transphobic and homophobic beliefs and we make them a part of our core belief about ourselves, the world, and others. This often leads to internalized homophobia and can even lead to suicide um, to escape that traumatic experience that encompasses just coming out. Um, some individuals with prolonged, uh, some individuals prolonged disclosing 
uh, their traumatic experience for fear that it will be associated with their sexual orientation or gender identity. Specifically, when we're thinking about uh, Boston or Philadelphia or any of these instances of where religious members are sexually abusing, abusing children. Um, later as adults, uh, uh, many were thought not to want to explore their identities or sexual uh, orientations for proof that because they were assaulted, that is why they are gay or that is why they are trans. And of course, there's no proof or research that proves this. Yeah, and the, the impact of trauma on identity developed, um, the fear of disclosing these traumatic events, um, can get worse as the longer that someone waits to address their abuse history um, in a therapeutic environment, the longer these effects can make an impact on the overall well being of the individual. Um, due to the nature of coming out, individuals might lose their support systems, further impacting their ability to cope with traumatic experiences as they do not have the proper protective factors to reinforce that safety and that sense of support. Um, by not disclosing or not addressing traumatic experiences, um, the individual will face higher and prolonged senses of shame, marginalization, um, and isolation due to the heterosexist and cisgender norms within society. And it can be really isolating. Um, and it's also seen in gender non-conforming folks and how they may often hide or deny their gender identity for fear of repercussions of the community um, and community violence contributing to their internalized transphobia. And as we've mentioned before, we, in, we swallow up those, um, the messages we hear from society and we internalize them and that can affect folks in these kinds of ways. And before we move on, uh, we wanna check in with you guys and see if you guys have any questions um, or uh, any comments uh, before we continue. Feel free to drop it in the chat or um, unmute yourself. If there are no questions, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. And then I know where you're ready to uh, continue. I got one, two, okay. Looks like we're ready to keep going. Um, now we're gonna talk about different forms of coping um, with trauma. Um, LGBTQ, uh, folks have higher rates of suicide ideation and attempts. Um, positive ways of coping include involvement in therapy, support groups, which we'll talk about later in our uh, slides about like things that we have available at our center. School, work, extracurricular activities, socializing with other members of the LGBT community, um, seeing yourself represented, creating, etc. cetera. Uh, negative ways of coping, include uh, substance use, engaging risky behaviors, self-isolation, um, self-harming, and once like we talked about earlier, suicide ideation. Um, social support really does provide a stim stimulation of emotional coping. And uh, like we go, like I said before, mental health services, um, the feeling of community, fellowship, uh, have an emotional effect on the brain. Um, when social support is limited, it negatively influences a person's ability to cope. Um, it, isolation does lessen that window of tolerance that we talked about earlier. LGBTQ survivors of, of trauma can benefit from embracing their sexual orientation and gender identity rather than avoid it. Um, a study that we have listed here, uh, Rivera noted that LGB, LGB youth who experienced uh, peer victimization had PTSD-like symptoms and were more accepting of their orientation, um, which be 
explained by the victimizations of forcing them towards a greater self-awareness and self-acceptance. One study found that transgender folks were able to cope with the after effects of trauma due to resiliency developed by pride in both their racial and gender identity. Um, that's why it's so important to have that uh, social support. Um, and then the, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration recognizes um, these trauma-informed practices as effective for treating trauma. And so these are just a couple more recommendations along with the series um, on how to help someone cope with these traumas or um, how to support somebody through that. Um, so first we're gonna recognize the impact of violence and victimization on the individual's development and coping strategies and validate that for them. Um, knowing that they are this way because of the influences that have led them there um, and validating that and not taking that from them. Um, two is center recovery from trauma as the primary goal of intervention. Um, and three is utilizing an empowerment model or approach in work with people who have disempowered, who have been disempowered by traumatic exposure, such as um, DBT or um, CBT or also trauma or solution focused therapy. Um, four is to prioritize the client's choice, their voice and their sense of control as um, folks that have experienced trauma tend to feel like there is no sense of control that this thing happened to them without their consent um, when they weren't ready, um, no matter what that was, whether that was sexual abuse, physical abuse, or a traumatic event, um, there's this underlying lack of control. Um, and five is to ensure practice efforts are firmly rooted in relational collaboration. So really strengthening that alliance with the individual and building that rapport and doing so with empathy and respect. Um, six is emphasizing the importance of creating safe, respectful, and trustworthy therapeutic environments and relationships in effort to minimize the possibility of re-traumatization. Um, and as we mentioned in our previous parts of the series, um, we've mentioned ways to do that by respecting someone's pronouns, um, by being aware of their triggers. Um, um, if trust is a issue for them, then making sure that you aren't sharing um, their information with their families um, and not exposing them in that way, because that could expose them to harm. Here's some trauma and for practices as well. Um, like we've talked about, it's necessary to have a trauma informed approach when working with the LGBT population. As these individuals carry the load of oppressive, marginalized, and prejudiced forces against them, it is important to use trauma informed approach not only to continue, uh, to, in order to not continue or cause harm for individuals who have encountered traumatizing experiences while working with mental health services. Um, SAMHSA uh, recommend, recommends that organizations and institutions incorporate the knowledge of cultural, historical, and gender issues to practice, uh, noting the importance of organizations that challenges stereotypes, attends the power of language to biases and inclusion, values cultural strength and resilience, and acknowledges the impact of historical trauma for oppressed and marginalized groups. Um, on a group level, oh, my bad. Next slide. On a group level, recognizing the lack of trust towards privileged groups and oppressors, uh, discriminatory, 
discriminatory practices aimed at limiting freedom and denying of rights, and on an individual level, recognizing historical structural oppression resulting in trauma with it, which LGBTQ folks experiences. Um, Don Donum, I want to say your name right. I'm sorry. I apologize if I'm not saying it right, but I will get to your question after um, this next slide. Um, we're at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, so we're looking at post-traumatic growth. We want to emphasize this um, resilience factor and this measure helps serves as a protective factor um, for re-traumatization. And so what resilience is defined as is the ability to rebound after a challenge or difficulty and has the ability to withstand the stress through internal and external resources and at attributes. Um, we do so with using strength-based approaches to foster this resilience and in internal and external protective factors um, as it could come to going to support groups and finding community, um, as it could also come to learning the skills to um, test your thoughts, to do a thought record. Um, and another one is um, finding meaning and making in the traumatic experiences. And, and this is really important in validating the traumatic experience for the person and what they felt about it. Um, and also trying to make some meaning out of it, this horrible, horrible thing that happened. Um, improvement in personal coping strategies based on lessened, lessons learned from traumatic exposure. Um, so learning their triggers and how to cope with those triggers, um, finding personal inner strengths, um, finding a deeper sense of purpose or meaning in life, um, arriving at a clear goal and priorities for one's life. Um, this can also look in gratitude and appreciation for one's life. Um, improving relationships, as I mentioned before, and as Brittany's highlighted throughout this presentation, um, the importance of community for individuals who have experienced a traumatic event and is specifically for LGBTQ plus individuals. Having that sense of community um, lowers the rates of re-traumatization. And then um, enhanced motivation to give back to others and maybe sharing that story um, advocating for a change can also be um, beneficial in this resilience factor. And yeah, and so what we see is that um, these things are all necessary in recovering from trauma and building resilience. And so working with a trauma informed therapist and or trained therapist um, to work through those past traumas, to gain self-awareness from different emotions, body awareness, or different feelings, such as anxiety, feelings of annoyance, nervousness, um, by using mindfulness and being in tune and aware of one's body. Um, also finding coping skills to help when you're feeling overwhelmed by um, the sensations or emotions associated with those past traumas. Um, another recommendation is consistent yoga practice as it's been seen to decrease levels of PTSD, levels of symptoms of PTSD. Um, also healing, keeping in mind that healing is very subjective and not linear to everyone. That that this healing doesn't just happen in one straight line, that this is going to happen over time. And at times it will get hard, um, but also building that resilience that it will get better and that, you can, that the individual can get through it. 
Um, another coping skill could be learning how to breathe calmly and remaining in um, a state of related physical relaxation, um, even when accessing painful or horrifying memories. Um, this is essential for recovery and in um, trauma-informed treatment to be able to go back to those coping skills when needed. And here uh, we're gonna continue our talk about resilience um, and building resilience. Um, practicing mindfulness, as Jordan just mentioned, um, really helps calm down the sympathetic nervous system. So you're less likely to be thrown into hyperarousal um, or hypoarousal, that fight or flight response. Um, like we've talked about earlier, relationships, having a good support system, good support network is one of the most powerful protections about become about becoming re-traumatized. This can include social support, loved ones, and chosen family. Um, taking action. Um, stress hormones are secreted during traumatic situations, and they are meant to give us strength and endurance to respond to the extraordinary conditions. After doing something to help deal with these stress, like helping others, help reduce symptoms of trauma. This can look like helping others, but it can also look like reporting events. It can mean um, going uh, with a lawyer uh, to see about a traumatic event, um, reporting, um, not to all, but to, to some. Physical touch in the form of hugs, touch, or being rocked. Um, some friends with uh, who have that hyper arousal really like deep pressure, um, like her swings. Um, this can increase feelings of safety and grounding for persons. Um, and of course, finding professional therapy that specializes in trauma-informed approaches. I like this little graph. It has strength, uh, confidence, motivation, protecting yourself, effort, change, and agility. Um, and here is some, oh, this is actually you, Jordan, my bad. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Here are some resources. Um, like Brittany was saying, so the LGBTQ plus center, Orange County, which is us who we represent, um, we have a ton of resources such as, um, the groups that I'm going to be sharing actually on this next slide. Um, and also other groups that are not even on this calendar, this calendar that I'm going to show in the next slide is specifically for the elevate program. Um, but we have a ton of other resources, a ton of other events um, for folks to check out. Um, just increasing that sense of community, like we've been advocating throughout this whole um, this whole presentation, is the importance of community and that protective factor. Um, private practice therapists specializing in trauma informed CBT um, and LGBTQ plus affirmative therapy is essential in um, unpacking this trauma, especially when it pertains to the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus community. Um, checking in with your insurance provider to get linked with a th therapist. Um, NAMI Orange County is another great or organization. Um, Mental Health Association of Orange County. We have Be Well OC. We have um, Orange County Behavioral Health, and we have Pathways of California and Pacific Clinics. And then here is our spring summer schedule uh, that you guys can screenshot for 2023. Mondays, we have QChat, which is a social support group. Um, we also have QChat in Espanol. We have Breakout, which is a mental health process processing group for teens, um, which I run and another co-facilitator runs. We have Jilla, uh, Gender Flood, which is an 18 plus group, um, which provides social support and educational support. PRISM, uh, which is another social and educational support group that is 18 plus. On Tuesdays, we have advocacy through Art the Coalition. Um, they're also having a presentation coming up pretty soon. Um, that's gonna be look really pretty to look through uh, all the art that's come through uh, um, as a way of self-expression and uh, communication. Wednesdays, we have the Queer Men's Group, which is 18 plus. That's the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and is 
for social support. We have Studies with Pride, which is an educational group, CISNT, which is an educational social support group, and Rainbow Group, which is also a social support and educational group. On Thursdays, we have Outlet, led by Jordan. It is an 18 plus mental health processing group. Um, and the Elevate also has the Youth Empowerment Act to act. Um, on Fridays, we have In-Betweeners, in which is on the first Fridays. That's a social support group. South County Rainbow Group. Um, and we also have Breaking Boundaries um, and Rainbow Connection, which is on specific Fridays. There's our team all listed there if you want more information on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I, our next slide is going to have our um, post test survey that I will drop in the chat right now. And just so you all can um, complete it right now, if you can, if you're having trouble accessing it, let me know. Um, yeah, but we have a question in the chat um, while y'all are filling that out. Would you like to answer? Yeah, sure. I was looking over it, uh, Jonam, and I saw that you're all are from South Korea. That's super cool. Uh, welcome to have you. Um, and you'd like to know how to deal with internalized homophobia and transphobia. Um, yes, we actually have uh, a uh, whole presentation on it. That's the first one. Um, definitely check it out. Um, and yes, it is very difficult because you you do feel a lot of that sadness um, um, and helpless uh, when people have um, incorporated that into their lives. Um, that is a core belief uh, that is unhelpful and also untrue. So I think I think you're going about it the right way of like looking at self affirmation. Um, maybe some maybe some uh, like uh, some statements, writing nice statements about yourself and having that present. Um, and also probably dealing with like uh, finding support outside of that system. Um, if they're continuing to get those messages, um, finding a way to removing that from themselves and exposure to others in the community is very helpful. Um, to actually get that uh, fellowship, um, to talk about these things, um, being around others and seeing others. Um, anything you wanted to add to that, Jordan? Yeah. Um, also unpacking like where those messages came from um, of not feeling enough in your body or um, I think you're, yeah, in homophobia or transphobia, um, like not feeling like that's enough or feeling like um, it's not good enough according to society's expectations of it. Um, unpacking where those messages came from because a lot of the time it does come from um, society's um, heteronormativism and cisgenderism culture that gets imposed on us um, as we develop. And we internalize that, although not a lot of the time are we aware of that. We have to recognize it in order to process it. And I hope that helps. And I see we have another question from Jazzy. Hey, um, I was just curious, the art and advocacy group do they have any like meetings or volunteer opportunities? I would be interested in that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, totally. Um, if you where would, would I find that? If you want to email me after, uh -huh. um, I'm the one sending out all the Zoom links and everything. Wonderful. Um, email me directly, and I'll get you linked up with the right people. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Of course. Excited to hear for you to um, be a part of this. Awesome. Thank you so much.
Any other questions or follow-ups to anything? I see here, helping them detach from messages from social stigma so they can see how amazing they are. Yeah, connecting resources are very important. Yes, very much. I'm, I'm happy that you found that helpful, love it. Definitely check out our first uh, thing. It's our first YouTube link. Uh, we go into a little bit more depth uh, about core beliefs and internalization. Mm -hmm. I do too. I do too. Uh, this center here in OC, um, traditionally very conservative era, it's, it's been a boom uh, for folks in the community uh, to find uh, a space like this. Um, we're very lucky over here. And I'm excited to hear you build one over there. Any other questions or things that we can uh, address or clarify? If we're all good, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. I got one, I got two, I got three, okay. Well then thank you guys very much uh, for attending um, and uh, we hope to see you guys around, bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.